Today we're looking at another heavily requested Styro Pyro video. This one is called, is it the volts or amps that kill? The answer is yes. <laughs> Those of you who don't know me, I'm Tyler Fulce. I'm a nuclear engineer with a little over 10 years of experience in the commercial nuclear power industry. From engineering to operations to emergency response. I don't claim to know everything there is nuclear, but I can certainly share some knowledge. And yes, we cover electrical safety quite extensively, but probably not. Not in the same way that Styro Pyro does. So let's see what he has to say about this topic. But what is it that makes some sources lethal and others not? One way to find out. Oh lord. <laughs> I mean, he's got some safety glasses, so he has some level of PPE. <laughs> this guy's crazy. I want to clear up some common misconceptions about electricity. Now I'll be honest. I'm not an electrician or an engineer, but I do have a bunch of terrifying electrical devices, as well as the- I was gonna say, he has all this practical experience here. It doesn't really matter. I guarantee you he knows, a, just from personal experience, a lot more about electrical safety than the average electrician or electrical engineer for that matter. In fact, so, not an electrical engineer, but one thing I will say is those people that are physically closer to the potentially unsafe thing generally have a lot more first-hand knowledge of safety. Yes, the, uh, the engineer, whether it's electrical engineer, nuclear engineer, mechanical engineer, would have a lot more textbook knowledge, but in terms of practical knowledge, this is probably one of the biggest learning curves I had throughout my career was the transitioning from the engineering field to the operations field. Bunch of textbook knowledge in the engineering, but didn't even set foot into the power plant that much. And then when we went into operations, oh man, oh man, there was a lot of, uh, <laughs> a lot of um, practical knowledge, a lot of, uh, a lot of cultural changes, and a lot of, just that experience. And I'm very grateful to have had that opportunity throughout my career to make that transition because it ultimately made me a better engineer, better manager, just having, having that uh, field operational experience. So that taught me about nuclear safety, per personal safety, electrical safety far more than what I learned in the classroom. Not to say that Getting a degree is unimportant because that's certainly not the case at all. But combining both, that's when you really start to learn. Most importantly is that I'm willing to do some crazy stuff to prove a point. In fact, <laughs> I'm willing to put myself into circuits that should be lethal by their logic. That's a powerful way to bolster your argument, to show that they're wrong by saying, by their logic, I should be dead right now. That's a, that's a very powerful counter argument. Exactly about electricity that makes it dangerous. Well. This is a complicated question, and the answer depends highly on the source of that electricity. That thing right there can be quite dangerous if you have a pacemaker. Radio frequency interference, heat, can mess up some electronics, so it, it, it kind of depends on your situation as to what's dangerous and what isn't. It's fascinating. Let's consider our biggest design vulnerability when it comes to electricity, and that's the nervous system. <laughs> Nerve cells work on electrical signals that are a small fraction of a single volt, so it really doesn't take much to override these with outside means. I mean, anybody who's liked a 9-volt battery knows how easily a mere 9 volts overpowers all the signals going to your tongue. Oh. <laughs> now that we've looked at our design vulnerabilities, Ow, holy. let's start playing with some fun electrical sources to see if it's the volts or amps that play a bigger role. There we go. <laughs> going off of my previous comments, it seems that most people with professional experience said it's just the current that kills. That's what a lot of training guides actually say, is it's just the current. The current is the volume of electrons that can cause little zappy things to happen to you. They need a voltage in order to push said amount of current through you. So current by itself ain't going to do a whole lot. <laughs> Here I've hooked up a car battery up to these steel rods. Now this battery can dump up to a thousand amps, yet touching these bare rods doesn't do anything to me. You don't have oh, the voltage. you think the battery's dead? Nope. The thing is, that battery can dump a thousand amps, but not through me. It's only a 12 volt source after all, and my skin's resistance is high enough to block all but a minuscule amount of current from going through my body. This is Ohm's law in action. 
You can't always use this logic when judging the hazard of an electrical source, but it does work for low voltages like this. So this all makes it seem like it's the volts that matter here, right? Let's take a look at this electrical shock hazard chart. There's actually- Okay, yeah. Anyone who's had some like electrical safety procedure, there's something like this that's always like an addendum in your little electrical safety handbook that looks at voltage, current, what type of personal protective equipment you need for the job for your shock hazard and also your arc flash hazard. And there's usually something like this in the back of all those procedures. Nothing about voltage on here at all, only current. What gives? This assumes that that source can put that current through you, yeah. which means it has to have a sufficiently high voltage to do so, as well as a low enough impedance. But what kind of voltages are we talking about here? According to the chart, less than 100 milliamps of current can be lethal. My body's resistance is about 250,000 ohms. So according to Ohm's, Ohm's law, law yeah. I need a voltage of about 25,000 volts to kill me. Seems simple enough, right? Let's go ahead and put that idea to practice. All right, let's slowly crank up the voltage there. Oh, it's conducting. Ha, <laughs> look at that, the apple's dead. <laughs> Ohm's law said I'd need a million volts, yet it was passing 100 milliamps at barely over 1,000 volts. What gives? It turns out you can throw Ohm's law out the window in situations like this. <laughs> because the apple experienced something called dielectric breakdown. Yes. When the voltage across an insulator reaches a high enough point, the molecules in it get shredded by the electric field. This means the insulator suddenly becomes a conductor and will allow a huge amount of current to pass through it. It's, it's, another, it's just an example of things in textbook, not because things do break down and there are also losses associated with it. It's the same reason why Ohm's law wouldn't really work too well on transmission lines because there's losses within the line i mean you would the classic example of a circuit just doesn't assume that the wire it it assumes the wire itself is perfectly conductive which really isn't the case it's one of the reasons why you step up the voltage so high on large-scale transmission lines just so you don't lose as much because it's about electrical efficiency and you don't want to have it lost just just to the transmission line if you've ever been shocked by a live wire without touching ground at the same time, you've experienced this. What's completing the circuit here? A capacitor, of course. Notice how the resistance of this capacitor is so high that it can't be measured by my meter, yet it still can pass a bunch of current. That's because AC can pass through a capacitor. You have yes. a capacitance too, which is why you can feel a shock from touching a single line. That's the other thing why Ohm's Law is only good for light for for batteries, for for direct current. There's no um, there's no alternating sine wave phenomena going on. So that's why you have capacitive and um, inductive loads. And just think of it as another form of losses from just electric and magnetic fields expanding and contraction. That that's where that energy physically goes. Another efficiency hit from anything that that generates electricity, including whether it be a diesel generator or even a massive nuclear power plant. Not all loads are, are purely resistive. Well, this is the point where I start putting myself into circuits that should be lethal under that premise. Even this very chart acknowledges it's more than just the current that kills. There's a whole axis in time, and the chart is only valid for a small range of frequencies as well. That is another component, is the time component. And that and that's isn't just limited to electrical stuff. It is a huge component to radiological safety as well. And there it's time, distance, and, sh and shielding. And time is, like, you could, you could bear hug the elephant's foot at the carcass of the Chernobyl nuclear power plant and be fine if you do it on the order of seconds. <laughs> you can do a lot of crazy stuff if you somehow were to teleport to somewhere and then go away at just a fraction of a second. You can go to the center of the sun and if you were to like be there and back on the order of picoseconds or something like that. But there is a huge amount of time dependency, whether it's radiation, heat, or electricity for it to really cause those sort of effects. Even gravity, an another example, what kills you when you fall off a building is the rapid deceleration. 
And that's why parachutes are a thing. What they do is they slow down your deceleration period. So very many things in physics are all about time. I'm glad he's bringing this up. There's a lot of misconceptions about all types of science when it comes to this. So let's switch it up a bit using something else we experience, static electricity. Anytime you receive a static shock, the voltage you're being exposed to is quite high, much higher than what yeah. you get out of an outlet. High voltage, high current, low time. <laughs> but let's put that to the test. Right here I have a Van de Graaff generator. It's capable of generating very high DC voltages, similar to what you get from a static shock, just on steroids. Ow! <laughs> He's the most cheerful guy for getting shocked. Usually, there would be the use of expletives. Look at that. That was 40 amps. Considering the voltage here was on the order of 100,000 volts, yeah. the electrical power there was over a million watts. The idea that static shocks are low current is a myth. When you get shocked by static, you're eating amps of current. Ow! <laughs> I think he likes it. So, why don't you go to heaven when you get a static shock? Because you've been naughty. <laughs> what? I was not expecting that. <laughs> current alone doesn't tell you how much charge is transferred or for how long it happens. Current is just a rate of charge transfer after all. It's just like how your speed on a highway doesn't tell you how far you've gone or for how long you've traveled. Perfect analogy. I don't even know what to add to that. That's, that's, this is brilliant. <laughs> So simple to understand. I might as well murder the idea that it's just the current that kills. So I'm going to do something clinically insane to prove my point. So I've built this Tesla coil here. Now this is not an ordinary Tesla coil. It's one of the most powerful vacuum tube driven coils in existence. It straight up looks and sounds like a substation fault when it's running. <laughs> it also yes. melts the steel screwdrivers I use as breakout electrodes. It truly is a terrifying sight to behold. I know what you're thinking. It must be hard to resist touching something that looks as crazy as that, right? Well, I have given in to the temptation. And no, I'm not very sane for doing this. However, this is crazy. I do use a steel file to distance myself from that white hot arc. But of course, I'm still conducting pretty much the full current there. Besides, it doesn't stop the arc from jumping directly to me occasionally. <laughs> this, is, this is so, so crazy. Even if it can't kill you, but... I'm pretty, that white hot plasma bit right there, if he touch, touches that thing, that's, it's just hot. Forget the, forget the electrical hazard, there's a heat hazard in play too, and he's just, <laughs> wow. <laughs> so why doesn't it kill me? Most people will tell you it's because Tesla coils operate with gigantic voltages, but very little current. It's funny, because when it comes to electricity, there's no bigger mythological beast than the Tesla coil. All aspects I blame Command and Conquer for that one. Have, look at that. That's 3.2 amps of current. That's not low current at all. In fact, that's nope. actually terrifying. <laughs> I can still estimate the voltage at max power if I make the admittedly rough approximation that the coil is pure. Wow, that is... That's hard to do. Right so legibly. ...inductive. This gives a result of about 100,000 volts, which is about what I expect, really. The arc itself clamps the voltage pretty well, so that's why the voltage doesn't rise that much with considerably higher input power. I'm still conducting amps of current for a substantial amount of time when I do this. What's going on here? Many Tesla coil builders will tell you it's the skin effect at play here. Hmm. At high frequencies, currents in a conductor are magnetically pushed to the edges. And this effect is a critical consideration when it comes to designing a Tesla coil. Same thing with, uh, with generators and transmission lines and pushes things out to the edge. The skin effect is only significant at these frequencies when dealing with a good conductor like copper. When the material is resistive like flesh, that goes out the window. <laughs> so what hmm. is it then? Well, it turns out, our nerves aren't quite so susceptible to high frequencies. In somewhere beyond 10 kilohertz, the polarity flips too fast to depolarize a nerve cell membrane. This means your nerves pretty much don't register it, and that's why it doesn't electrocute. Touching a Tesla coil output is never really safe. You can get severe internal burns when conducting big RF currents. Yeah. I don't make a habit of touching arcs, and I keep my contacts brief. When I think of electrical hazards involving arcs, I think more of something like this. High heat, 
high temperature by high temperature talking well over 10,000 degrees Celsius and second and third degree burns. In fact, the arc flash, even the flash protection boundary that is assessed and calculated for switch gears in an industrial setting, that is the threshold for when you get second degree burns. Not the threshold when you emerge from the hazard unscathed, if God forbid an arc flash were to occur. Mainly think of all the horrific burn injuries or people just losing their lives when a switchgear explodes. And this is something that is very extensively covered at working at a nuclear power plant or I'd imagine any other large industrial facility where you use a lot of big switchgears, big transformers, large electrical components. What was interesting, though, was the, the highest arc flash hazard, at least in a place that I've worked, was actually the low side of a transformer. It stepped down from 4160 volts to 480 volts. Current was in the tens of thousands of amps, and that the arc flash rating was greater than 60 calories per square centimeter and said in big letters, no safe PPE exists, energized work prohibited. Those are the hazards, those are the main electrical hazards I actually think of, more of the arc flash stuff rather than the shock stuff, but this is interesting too. I should point out that the power supply driving the coil is absolutely lethal, and touching yeah. that would kill you before you hit the floor. Please don't demonstrate this. <laughs> <laughs> the funny thing is that the Tesla coil steps up the voltage and current of the supply, while also making it less lethal due to the higher frequency. High frequency is also part of what keeps you from getting zapped by touching a plasma globe. Yeah. The voltage on the outside is actually quite significant. Though it has its own other things of interfering with electronics and stuff, but sure. You, you don't have a pacemaker, you're probably fine. But a combination of the high frequency output, as well as the fact that it's a high impedance source, prevents you from getting zapped. Now, of course, high frequency won't protect you from something driven by a lethal high voltage source lacking isolation. My demon circuit is a classic example of- You want to see me react to his demon circuit, or as I prefer in that video's description, a fiery death machine using Soviet military tech? Please check it out. The flame arc there is running at over 13 megahertz, yet touching it would still kill you via the DC supply running it, since there's no isolation there. So what is it that makes exposure- No isolation means dangerous <laughs> to me. <laughs> Just in general. <laughs> Some electrical source is lethal and others not. Well, it's a combination of volts and amps and frequency and duration, as well as some other stuff that determine whether it's dangerous or not. The duration aspect is the one that I've noticed a lot of, even like the experienced professionals kind of forget about, because a lot of times it's kind of it's kind of in the back of the head, you just kind of forget about it, but yeah, he's spot on. It's a little bit of everything, and depending on what situation you're in. Here, he's just talking about the shock hazard, the, uh, the arc flash hazard's the one that's, the one that's more spooky to me, anyway. <laughs> that was a fun one. I love Styropyro's way of debunking misconceptions out there by driving them to their logical extreme and just disproving that. That is one of the most memorable ways of doing that. I, uh, I should show this to some electricians. <laughs> or some electrical engineers. I'm sure they would get a kick out of this. I loved him writing the laws on the apples and throwing them out the window, though. That's, uh, that's some really good stuff. <laughs> Thank you so much for watching. I'll see you next time.